Welcome. Wow. To the Time to Football podcast. My name is Hassan Khan, the host of this wonderful show that we like to call, you guessed it correctly, Time to Football. This is going to be a weekly show that we do every week on YouTube. Wednesdays at 8 p.m. is the goal to release this. But if you don't want to watch a 45-minute, hour-long video on YouTube, listen, that's totally understandable. You can join in on the audio experience. Go to iTunes, pull out the uh, podcast app on your phone, search for Time to Football, all one word with the number two, and subscribe to us, listen to us on the go. This is a show where we're going to talk about everything football, and not so much in the perspective of fantasy football, but also just and football in general. Get you guys caught up on different topics going around in the NFL. Uh, I want to first start off by saying thank you for the love that we've been getting on YouTube. Everybody was looking forward to these fantasy football starts and sets of videos to come back, and once we released our first one this past Tuesday for week one, we have been getting subscribers on top of subscribers in this channel. The Colt, ladies and gentlemen, the Colt is growing, and you guys are supporting small YouTube channels, and we love it. We're all here for you guys. We're here to help. It feels like we're the most trending thing on YouTube when it comes to football right now. Well, I mean, in the football community, the most trending thing right now is uh, Odell Beckham. Oh, gosh. let's uh, Don't search for him on Twitter. I, I will just say that. But... In today's episode, we're going to be giving you guys that we believe are going to break out for the 2020 NFL season, as well as some players that may not have the best season that a lot of people are predicting. We're going to give you about seven or eight players uh, that are going to break out, and then we're going to give you uh, about six or seven declining players. To start things off, Peter Schrager is an analyst for NFL Network. If you have no idea who this guy is, I encourage you and advise you to strongly look into Peter Schrager. He, every year, gives a list of about 10 breakout players uh, for every season in the offseason. And 80 to 90% of the time, he is correct. Once he called... Patrick Mahomes in 2018 to have an MVP season, not just a, not just progress for the Chiefs, but have an MVP season and say that he's going to be one of the best quarterbacks in the NFL for the next 10 years, that was enough for me. He correctly predicted that. I was like, I'm hooked. I'm going to listen to this guy because he knows what he's talking about. And the reason he knows what he's talking about is not just because he uses his eye test because he... Uh, sees how a player plays, and then he just conjures up his own opinion. But instead, he's well-connected with almost every NFL team, has sources everywhere, and he hears what people are talking about, what's buzzing in training camp, and he conjures up his own opinion based off of factual information on who's impressing in training camp, and he gives his list of breakout players every year. On top of Patrick Mahomes, he's correctly called... Danielle Hunter in 2018 for the Minnesota Vikings. Marlon Humphrey for the Baltimore Ravens, who's one of the best defensive backs in the NFL currently. Josh Allen, he correctly predicted that in 2019, he wasn't just going to take a step up, but he was going to lead the Buffalo Bills to the playoffs. Correctly predicted all those things, and I'm saying all this because a couple of guys on this list are names that he mentioned are going to break out in 2020. Starting off with the first player that I'm personally high on as well, Van Jefferson in LA. When you catch the attention of a head coach because of your work ethic, you're going to get some playing time for sure. Van Jefferson is currently listed as the fourth wide receiver on the Rams depth chart and that's because he's a rookie in the NFL Josh Reynolds is a number three they're giving that spot to Josh Reynolds because of veteran deference they want to respect the veteran 
totally understandable. But if you're hearing things coming out of training camp, it's that Van Jefferson is more than likely going to dethrone Reynolds for that number three spot and play out of the slot. We talked about work ethic. Sean McVay loves his work ethic on the field, but also his ability, ability to focus and his work ethic in the film room as well. He's a good student, a good pupil of the game, and Sean McVay has noticed that. Jefferson, we talked about, could be working out of the slot. And a guy that is really well known for his route running ability in Van Jefferson is being compared to someone like, oh, I don't know, Keenan Allen. He's got comparisons to Keenan Allen, who's a top 15, maybe top 10 receiver in the NFL. I would say that's a pretty strong comparison between two great route runners. Jefferson is just one injury away to Cooper Cup and Robert Woods from really taking off. Number four receiver on the depth chart, but he's still going to get significant amount of playing time given that the Rams like to run a lot of three wide receiver sets. And then once that injury happens to Cup or to Woods or one of them goes on a decline, which... uh, we kind of predict, not so much, a lot, but a little bit of regression in Robert Woods, which we're going to explain uh, later on in the at the end of the podcast. We're going to answer some fan questions. We're going to talk about Robert Woods. But he's just an injury and decline away from landing the number two wide receiver role in LA, and Van Jefferson is going to take off with it. So keep in mind that Jefferson is uh, for you guys that are playing a fantasy football, is going undrafted. And if you've got a spot on your bench that you can just give up for Jefferson, I'd go ahead and just pick him up. So he's going to help out that Rams passing game a lot, and that's why I believe that Jared Goff is going to throw at least 30 touchdowns uh, in 2020. Another guy, if we're speaking about uh, Peter Schrager, another guy that Schrager is so high on, Dan Arnold, tight end. Arizona Cardinals may not have even heard of him. Don't know who this guy is, but let me fill you in. He was on the New Orleans Saints uh, just last year until he was picked up by the Arizona Cardinals towards the end of the season. He was a wide receiver converted to a tight end. The Saints were also big on him because before they had Jared Cook as their tight end, they wanted Dan Arnold, who's a big guy but also fast like a wide receiver, to be that tight end for Drew Brees. He was projected to dethrone Josh Hill, uh, the tight end, for his his role in New Orleans. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. He dropped a a very important pass in a game, and the Saints were just like, all right, you know what? We're just going to move on from this guy. That's where the Cardinals came in. They picked him up. Cliff Kingsbury loves this guy. He's building a rapport with Kyler Murray so much that in the three games that he played with Arizona towards the end of last season— He scored a touchdown in two of them. Kingsbury has carved out a role for Dan Arnold in that Arizona offense. And I'm not saying that Arnold is going to be the next 1,000-yard tight end receiver, but he is going to be playing a significant role in that Cardinals uh, offense. You could talk about DeAndre Hopkins being the number one option. You could talk about... Fitzgerald and Kirk being up there. But listen, after those guys, it's going to be Dan Arnold who's going to be a a, a receiver for Arizona. So for you guys that play fantasy football, I mean, this isn't necessarily saying that you should pick him up because he's not going to be that relevant in fantasy football, but he's going to take a step up and carve out a role for him so that maybe in 2021, he could be a fantasy tight end that you guys could draft for your team. Staying on the topic of tight end, this isn't a guy that Peter Schrager mentioned is going to be a breakout player. Instead, this is a guy that I'm personally big on. And I know you're going to roll your eyes for you guys that have been watching Time to Football for so long. I've been big on him for the last two years, ever since he entered the NFL. And in year three, I believe this is finally going to be the season for Dolphins tight end, Mike Gesicki. I know, I know. So here's the thing. In 2018, I predicted Mike Kosicki to be just this breakout 
NFL tight end. Just didn't work out because he was coached by Adam Gase. And Adam Gase, as we all know, doesn't like to use his players properly. I.e., examples of Kenyon Drake, Devontae Parker, Ryan Tannehill, all players that had good seasons once they were out of the control of Adam Gase. Mike Gesicki is another one of those guys. In 2018, coached by Adam Gase, was nothing. Was the number two tight end. 2019, finally, Adam Gase doesn't have control of him. Brian Flores comes in. Let's Kasiki fly. And towards the last half of 2019, had a fairly decent run. I think he scored about uh, five touchdowns. He had about 51 receptions and over 500 receiving yards, which is, you know, you could say it's mediocre, but he was the most targeted tight end in the red zone. This guy is athletically gifted. Do not sleep on Mike Gesicki. Now we're going to talk about a bunch of wide receivers. And wide receivers are just so deep. There are so many wide receivers that have been coming out of this uh, this draft class that have a lot of potential to play significant roles in their respected offense. We talked about Van Jefferson, the rookie. I want to mention another, another rookie that I believe is going to be uh, a breakout in 2020. It isn't C.D. Lamb. He could break out. It isn't Jerry Judy, could break out, but that's not who I have in mind. It's actually a guy taken in the second round. Michael Pittman on the Indianapolis Colts. The reason I love Pittman so much is because his size. He's compared to someone like Vincent Jackson uh, when he was playing with L.A. or San Diego at the time and Tampa Bay. Pittman was touted by Frank Reich the head coach of the Colts, to be one of, if not the best, wide receiver in that draft class. They have struck gold with Pittman. Currently listed as the number four receiver on the depth chart, but like we mentioned with Van Jefferson, that's because they're giving deference to veterans. They want to respect uh, the veterans ahead of them. So that includes Paris Campbell, that includes T.Y. Hilton, that includes Zach Pascal, but it's noted that in training camp, he's been looking impressive and that he's going to have a significant role with Phillip Rivers in that Indianapolis Colts offense. So watch out for uh, Michael Pittman. Moving on to another rookie wide receiver that was actually taken in the first round. Not CeeDee Lamb, not Jerry Judy, not even Henry Ruggs. Justin Jefferson on the Minnesota Vikings. And the reason I believe that he's going to be a breakout player in 2020 is because you've got to look at, you just got to use your head. You got to use your knowledge. You got to use your knowledge of the scheme that Minnesota plays. Their coaching staff going into 2020 hasn't changed that much. It's almost pretty much the same offense that they have minus Stephon Diggs. Oh, you lost your number two receiver. And comes Justin Jefferson, a guy that you drafted to be that replacement for Stephon Diggs. Diggs is known for his route running ability to be that 6'1", 205, 210 player, similar to the size as Justin Jefferson. So they drafted someone that could be the next Stephon Diggs in that Minnesota offense. And if you look at that offense, they're heavily leaning on that run game, but also Kirk Cousins and Adam Thielen And Stephon Diggs in 2019, when they got into beef about not passing the ball so much because they were being a run team, guess what they did? They passed the ball and then the receivers went off. I think that this is the the same thing that's going to happen in 2020. Justin Jefferson is going to come in and pretty much just take the role of Stephon Diggs. Thielen is clearly going to be the number uh, one guy. BC Johnson is listed as as the number two guy. But like we mentioned earlier with all the other players, they try to give those veterans that deference because they respect the veterans and they want to list them ahead of the rookies on the depth chart. But Justin Jefferson has been looking way more impressive in scrimmage and in OTAs, and he's going to be the next Stephon Diggs for that Minnesota Vikings offense. Another guy that we're predicting to have a big 2020, not a rookie, but he is going into his sophomore campaign, so he's still kind of young, played at Clemson, Raiders wide receiver Hunter Renfro. A slot receiver. The reason being because they drafted Henry Ruggs, who's projected to be their number one receiver. Brian Edwards in the third round. 
Tyrell Williams is now hurt. So on the depth chart, don't be surprised if they have Ruggs number one, Brian Edwards number two, and then Renfro at number three. That just means that he's going to be working out of the slot, and they're going to use him the same way that they did last season. And how they used him last season was, in the last two games, he had 100-yard games back-to-back. Six receptions in one game, seven receptions in the other. So they love Hunter Renfro. He's going to be that guy that can just, you could dump the ball off to him. A safety net. Him and Darren Waller are going to be those guys. So expect Renfro to have a big 2020 We expect him to have 88 targets for the season, about 60 receptions or so, 757 yards receiving, and about six touchdowns. So for you guys that play fantasy football, he's going undrafted. If you have a spot that you can give up for Hunter Renfro, because why not? I highly advise you to pick him up, but uh, we expect Renfro to have uh, a stat line similar to uh, those numbers that I just told you guys. The last player that we believe is going to break out in 2020, and when I say break out, I'm not talking about is going to rush for 1,200 yards, is going to rush for 10 touchdowns. I'm talking about they're going to do better than what people expect them to do. You're going to roll your eyes at this name, but Le'Veon Bell, why not? Okay, let's talk about the negatives of Le'Veon Bell. Let's say why people don't like him. 3.2 yards a carry. Last season. Okay. Yeah, that's not good. Jets offensive line was poor. That whole offense in general was not that good. And plus, Adam Gase is the head coach and was not a fan, according to multiple reports, of the signing of Le'Veon Bell. On top of that, they bring in Frank Gore. They bring in LaMichael Pirine. And you'd expect them to be splitting carries because Adam Gase is going to Adam Gase. Okay, he doesn't know how to use players properly, like we mentioned earlier in the podcast. We talked about Kenyon Drake. We talked about Ryan Tannehill, Devontae Parker, all three players that we thought were not that good, but ended up doing well once they got out of the control of Adam Gase. So he may not know how to use his players properly, but let me explain why I believe Le'Veon Bell is going to do well, and those aren't concerns for 2020. So a couple weeks ago, I think it was two or three weeks ago, I'm 99% sure. And the reason I'm not 100% sure is because I didn't get tested. That gave me a piece of paper that said that I was positive, but I'm 99% sure that I had COVID. And the reason I know this is because I didn't realize this until after the fact, but I looked back and Sunday, it was a Sunday night, woke up, uh, or that Sunday night, I had a headache. That Monday, I woke up, still had a headache, lost my sense of taste and smell. Tuesday, headache went away, still couldn't taste or smell anything. And then Wednesday, I was completely fine. No body aches, no coughing, no uh, shortness of breath. I was perfectly fine. That's pretty much it. But the reason I'm bringing this up is because I was nervous that, oh man, well, the media is telling me that you know, this is like a big deal and I'm not going to get political or anything. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying that like my thoughts or whatever everybody's thoughts are. COVID is serious. You should wear a mask whenever uh, you're around people just so you, because other people respond to it differently. But I was being told by the media, Hey, this is like a big deal. This is this, this is that. And then I actually went through it and it wasn't that big of a deal. The reason I'm bringing that up is because that's when I realized the media overplays a lot of things and there's a lot of things that you cannot look into or believe. And the same thing goes with the NFL, honestly, because a lot of media, uh, as respectable as some of them may be, may hear one report and then a lot of people, whether whether it be those media members that overblow it or a lot of fans will overblow it as well. Take it how you see it, okay? So, with Le'Veon Bell, the media is saying that him and Adam Gase do not have a good relationship. So this is going to lead to the downfall of Le'Veon Bell. When in fact, Adam Gase himself, Le'Veon Bell himself, have told the media, there is no hard feelings. We actually like each other and we are going to work really well together. I'm sorry, but I would rather believe those two direct sources, when you're talking about the relationship between two people... I'd rather listen to those two sources 
than a third-party source that comes up with their own opinion and overblows a story. Sources are saying that Adam Gase is going to use Frank Gore and use LaMichael P. Ryan to split carries with Le'Veon Bell. Maybe that's true, but honestly, Adam Gase has said himself that he did not use Le'Veon Bell the way that he wanted to use Le'Veon Bell, which means that he could see an influx of work. So there's a lot of things that you should really take with a grain of salt whenever media talks about some things. I'd rather look to the direct source and fact check and come up with my opinion based off of that, off of facts, rather than opinions of what other people may say. So, Bell, is there a chance that he could be a bust and not do that as well as people are saying? Yeah, there's always that chance, but I'm telling you, you have nothing to worry about because a lot of the reports don't make a lot of sense. Plus, on top of that, the offensive line has gotten better. That Jets offense will not be as bad as it was touted as the worst offense in the NFL last season when they had third string quarterbacks and Trevor Simeon and all these guys coming in to start in place of Sam Darnold. Well, if Darnold is healthy and can spread the ball around, that opens up the run game. Bell is going to be the guy that gets those carries on the goal line. So listen, I'm not saying he's going to run for 1,200 yards and 10 touchdowns, like I said. But 1,000 yards rushing? Yeah, it's believable. 60 to 70 receptions because there's a lot of plays out there that have been using in scrimmage of him lining out wide and beating corners in the eds in the end zone to get a touchdown. They're using him out wide in the slot and in the receiving game in general. So 60 to 70 receptions as he had 66 receptions last season, it's doable. Five, six, seven touchdowns total. Yeah, that's believable. Hey, guess what? For you guys that are fantasy football fans, those numbers that I just said, those are solid running back two numbers. He's not going to be a breakout as far as the best running back in the NFL, but he's going to be pretty freaking good for the New York Jets. So Le'Veon Bell is a guy that I believe is going to have a good season in 2020. So those are our breakout players for 2020. We're going to give you our names for declining players of 2020. But first, before we get into that, We're going to take a quick break to tell you guys about Manscaped, okay? Let me show you guys real quick the Lawn Mower 3.0, all right? Turning this thing on, rubbing my finger all over it, not even cutting me. Isn't that impressive? This thing right here, if you use the promo code T2F and click the link in the description for you guys that are listening to this on iTunes or uh, on YouTube, click the link in the description and at checkout, use the promo code T2F, you get this on top of this whole entire kit of, uh, let me show you guys what's in here. Hair and body wash. You've got ball toner, whatever that is. You've got ball deodorant. Listen, I'm going to use all this stuff because like I've been mentioning, I'm getting married this weekend. So I need to look my best in all areas of my body. So you best believe I'm going to be using Manscaped and you can too. So if you use that promo code T2F at checkout, You get 20% off plus free shipping. Support this channel. Like I said, I'm getting married. You don't have to get me a gift off the wedding registry, but you can support this channel by getting yourself your own personalized Manscaped Lawnmower 3.0 kit, courtesy of Manscaped. So check that out. Link in the description. Now we're going to talk about declining players for 2020. And oh, a lot of you guys are going to laugh at me from these names and not believe me, but let me just say, you there is no such thing as a right or wrong prediction before the prediction were to happen. So I'm just saying that right now. With these six or seven players, just keep that in mind. First up, Lamar Jackson. Ladies and gentlemen, the MVP of 2019. How is he going to fare in 2020? It's hard for a player to replicate the MVP numbers that he had a season before. We see it time and time again in almost any single player. And Lamar Jackson is not an exception. Okay, we're predicting him to do fairly well. I believe close to 1,000 yards rushing and uh, 24 passing touchdowns. But it's not going to be that 36 passing touchdowns on top of the rushing ability that he had in 2019. That's just almost impossible to do. So... Don't expect much out of him because of that. 
and we expect Lamar Jackson to decline uh, in 2020. So still a top five quarterback if you want to talk about fantasy football numbers, but nothing more than that. The second guy that we believe is going to decline in 2020, Panthers wide receiver DJ Moore. And this hurts me to say it because I love Moore. Great talent. I love Teddy Bridgewater. I love Christian McCaffrey. I love the whole Panthers offense and winning games and what Matt Rule has planned for 2020. But you have to look at history. Whenever Teddy Bridgewater came into the NFL in 2014, every wide receiver that he's played with has failed to produce a 1,000 yards for that season. Now, Michael Thomas, only exception. In the games that he played with Teddy Bridgewater, he was already on pace to score over or get over 1,000 yards, and he crushed that by 1,700 yards. But every receiver that he's played with, that includes Stephon Diggs and other good receivers that he's played with. So Bridgewater is more of the – he's more concerned about winning games. He's going to do whatever he can – to win football games, and I think that's what every NFL player has in mind. But this is what this Panthers is. Uh, this Panthers offense is revolved around winning football games, which is not bad. I understand you got to win your games, but as far as numbers go, as far as stats go, don't expect much out of DJ Moore. The last two seasons, he's hasn't been touchdown friendly. So this year, we only predict him to get four receiving touchdowns, which isn't much. And on top of the fact that Teddy Bridgewater hasn't produced a 1,000-yard receiver, it is kind of concerning. We predict DJ Moore to have 70 receptions at least and be that number one receiver uh, for Teddy Bridgewater. But, man, if you're talking about DJ Moore or even Robbie Anderson, whatever you project them to have in 2020, you can expect them to be a step down from that. The next two go hand-in-hand. Tampa Bay receivers, Mike Evans and Chris Godwin. Now, when I say declining, I'm not talking about they're going to have bad seasons. That's not true. They're going to have great seasons. Okay, 1,000-yard receivers. I believe that we have Chris Godwin getting about eight touchdowns and Mike Evans around that range as well, seven or eight touchdowns. So they're going to have great years. And the thing that we are leaning towards on why we believe that they're going to have a decline in 2020, even though it's a slight decline, is because you have to look at the quarterback that they had in 2019, and that's Jameis Winston. Okay, don't roll your eyes just yet. All right? I know that your your thought process is that Jameis Winston sucks, and he's really bad, but also at the same time, he's really good. He's really good, but also really bad at the same time, which is, I don't know how that's possible, but Jameis Winston made it possible in 2019. 5,100 passing yards. 33 passing touchdowns. I'm going to say that again. 5,100 passing yards and 33 passing touchdowns. Those are the numbers that Tom Brady has to live up to if he wants to have the same kind of production out of Mike Evans and Chris Godwin in 2020. That's pretty freaking hard to do. Forget the 30 uh, the 30 interceptions that Jameis Winston threw. Okay, that's his fault. That's his mistake. That cost the Buccaneers a playoff spot. That cost the Buccaneers some games that they could have won, which Tom Brady is going to be much better at handling the ball. That doesn't matter in Mike Evans and Chris Godwin's production. What matters are those yards and those touchdowns. And I'm telling you, that's going to be freaking hard to replicate with Tom Brady, who I love, the greatest of all time. But if last year was any indication, and you could talk about how he's didn't have wide receivers, but if last year is any indication, it might be a little bit, just a tad bit of regression in Tom Brady happening this late in his career. So because of that, because of the numbers that he can't match that Jameis Winston threw, because of this offense bringing on so many freaking weapons with Rob Gronkowski, they have three solid tight ends that they can spread the ball around to. They have four solid running backs that they're going to use and split reps with. A lot is going on in that Tampa Bay offense that they're going to have to spread the love and share it. And I just don't see Mike Evans and Chris Godwin being those, if you're talking about fantasy football numbers, being those top five receivers uh, that they were or had the potential to be 
in 2019. I think Chris Godwin was the number two receiver when it was all said and done, and Mike Evans was top 10 as well. I don't know, man. Mike Evans, Chris Godwin, great years, but don't expect much. The next three declining players that we have uh, for 2020 are actually running backs, two of them being rookies for the same exact reason. First off, let's talk about Jonathan Taylor on the Indianapolis Colts. Talented running back. Very good at Wisconsin. But here's here's my gripe. I don't understand how people can come up with opinions on what they believe. Okay, so they say Jonathan Taylor is going to dethrone Marlon Mack for that starting job. And he's going to be the better running back. Okay, cool. That's an opinion, right? That's not a fact. We don't know that. But people will say their opinion so much and they start to believe it in their head. You know when you tell yourself uh, uh, something is true so much that that's all you know and you start to believe it? That's exactly what people do with their opinions uh, with football. And they've been saying that about Jonathan Taylor, about how he's going to be the bell cow back in Indianapolis and Marlon Mack is going to be forgotten about. They've said it so much to themselves that they start to believe it. When in reality, like I said, you've got to look at the facts. You've got to look at what's true and what you know. And what we know is that Marlon Mack is currently the starter in Indianapolis. So since we know that, and that's a fact, we have to treat it like Marlon Mack is going to be the better player in 2020. Later on down the road, maybe in the last half of the season, Can Jonathan Taylor do better? Yeah, absolutely. But you cannot say that is 100% going to happen. Frank Reich, Chris Ballard, those GMs uh, and that head coach, when they made that selection to get Jonathan Taylor, Frank Reich texted Marlon Mack and said, listen, man, don't take this as an offense. We didn't do this because we hate you. You know how we roll. We roll with a hot hand. We roll with a one-two punch with that RB duo that's going to help us win games in Indianapolis. Marlon Mack, very receptive of that. Understanding, he said, yes, sir, let's do it. Let's go win some games. So with Marlon Mack being the starter, we predict him to have 188 carries for 2020. Jonathan Taylor, we predict to have 150. So both neck and neck, there's going to be some games where Jonathan Taylor is going to get the majority of the carries. Vice versa, there's going to be some games where Marlon Mack is going to get the majority of the carries. But the edge is going to be given to Marlon Mack because he's the starter and he's going to do better and be more productive in 2020 than Jonathan Taylor. So that's my reasoning behind it. But I know a lot of you guys have different thoughts and different opinions on it. Totally understandable. But listen, Marlon Mack, don't sleep on him. He could be getting the majority of the work in Indianapolis. Another running back for the same exact reason, DeAndre Swift. Listen, I'm a Georgia fan. I love DeAndre Swift. Very talented running back. But to say that he's going to be better than Carrion Johnson, he could be better. He could be more talented. But what we know, like we mentioned with Jonathan Taylor, is that you have to go with the starter. You have to go with the facts. And the facts are that Carrion Johnson is going to be the starter in Detroit. And then you've got a touchdown vulture in Adrian Peterson that's taking fantasy points away from you if you are Carrion Johnson or DeAndre Swift uh, owner. So they're going to mix in all three running backs. Carrion Johnson, I believe we project him to get uh, close to 200 carries for the season because he's a starter. And DeAndre Swift, close to 154. So same exact reason. You cannot say that DeAndre Swift is going to be better than Carrion Johnson because that's just an opinion. You have to go off of what's factual. And what's factual is that Carrion Johnson is going to get the majority of the work. I cannot stress that enough. So watch out for that. The last declining player for 2020 a running back. And man, I feel sorry for you guys that, uh, for you fantasy football guys that drafted Leonard Fournette right before he got released from the Jaguars. But it's Leonard Fournette. There are four running backs total in that Tampa Bay offense that are going to be splitting time. And I don't know if that's going to be split evenly. I don't know if one is going to be the ground and pound, which could be Leonard Fournette. I don't know if One's going to be more the receiver, which could be Leonard Fournette. He's good in both areas. 
But Bruce Arians has said that Ronald Jones is going to be the number one back, at least on the depth chart, and is going to get the majority of the carries. So what does that tell me? That tells me with an offense that is built to be a high-scoring offense with Tom Brady and all these weapons, they're going to pass the ball a lot, maybe close to 35, 40, 45 times a game. Are you really going to have that much room on offense to run that much? I would be surprised if a team like Tampa Bay were to get more than 30 carries a game uh, between them. And if you look at those 30 carries, you got to split those four ways. That's about seven and a half. Is that seven? Yeah. seven. Wow, man. I'm good at math. Seven and a half carries each if you want to split that evenly. But we all know that's not going to happen. We all know that it's going to be more so Ronald Jones since he's going to be the uh, the number one running back on that depth chart. He's going to be getting 13, 14, 15 carries a game. LaShawn McCoy, maybe like five carries a game, five, six. Leonard Fournette, where's that? Five to 10, 10 carries, 11 carries, 12 carries. It's not going to be that much. So you can't expect that running back one production out of Leonard Fournette because that's going to be pretty hard to freaking do in that offense where they got to spread the ball uh, around so much. You're going to see a lot of players, and I would not be surprised in Tampa Bay throughout the season, complain about the amount of work that they're getting, about the amount of targets that each receiver is getting. I know this team is filled with a lot of humble guys, and they're not going to do that because it's all love, and they just want to win games and want to win Super Bowl. I get that, but deep down inside, they're going to wish that they're the superstar of the team and they're going to get more work. So I, I, I just don't see Leonard Fournette being that productive in this offense that is already tailored for other players to be productive. But those are our breakout players and our declining players as well. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to have a segment on the show where we answer some fan questions. And uh, this is mainly based off of uh, this week it's going to be fantasy football questions because a lot of you guys have been commenting on that Starts and Sits video. So I'm going to take some time to really uh, answer a few of those questions. So uh, this is actually coming from a few people. Robert Woods. What's the deal with Robert Woods? A lot of people have been asking, why do you have Robert Woods as a must set against the Dallas Cowboys and fantasy football? So the reason being is because the Cowboys were actually not that bad against receivers in 2019. I understand it's a fresh start. 2020 could be completely different, but like I was mentioning earlier in the podcast, you have to go off of what you know. And what we know is that the Cowboys, their secondary was fairly decent uh, last season in 2019. I think they were seventh, the seventh best team when it came to facing wide receivers as far as letting uh, fantasy wide receivers have that production. So Robert Woods is a guy that we mentioned could be on the decline. I love Robert Woods, but uh, 28 is not that old at all. But if there's any season where you could start to see a decline, even if it's a, a little bit, it could be Robert Woods, especially like we mentioned with that breakout player being Van Jefferson stepping in and really taking that role of uh, being that number two wide receiver eventually uh, in the future. So with all that being said, if you have no other option, start Robert Woods. I'm pretty sure he's not going to do that bad. You just don't expect him to have those fantasy, uh, those wide receiver one numbers uh, in week one. This next question is from Jake Perms. Pick two players, Gurley, Chark, or McLaurin in week one in a full PPR. My two players I would pick, Gurley and McLaurin. Gurley is a guy that if, if you have a running back that is very good in the receiving game in a full PPR league, yeah, you want to go ahead and start that guy. So Gurley is a guy that I really love uh, in the receiving game as well. As far as uh, McLaurin or Chark, Chark faces Indianapolis, which might improve their secondary. They're expected to be... Uh, improving in that department. So watch out for Chark. On top of that, McLaurin is facing an Eagle secondary that uh, has been releasing corners left and right. Uh, they released uh, Douglas, was it? Uh, and then Sidney Jones as well. So, you know, this Eagle secondary, it could be the only weak point of this defense against Washington. But 
Terry McLaurin on that Washington offense could be the only player that does well for that team. This next question is from Vitor Cardoso. Uh, should I start with Hunt, Emmanuel Sanders, or Chris Thompson? So Chris, Chris Thompson is a no-go. I know that I said Raquel Armstead is a, is a must-sit. That's because uh, the matchup against the Colts is bad. I know that Armstead, I realized later that he's on the COVID-19 list, so he's not going to play anyways. But uh, James Robinson, who's the number one back on that depth chart right now, or Chris Thompson, that spot is reserved for Jaguars running backs. Do not play Jaguars running backs against that improved defensive line of the Indianapolis Colts. So Chris Thompson is a no-go. Should I start with Hunt against the Ravens, or should I start with Emmanuel Sanders against Tampa Bay? Man, if if I'm choosing, I'm going to choose Emmanuel Sanders, mainly because even though Hunt could do well, we don't know, number one, his split share with Nick Chubb. We don't know if it's going to be the same thing as 2019 because Freddie Kitchens was a head coach. We have a new head coach, so we're going to have to wait one or two weeks before we can see what their split share is. And number two, it's the Baltimore Ravens, our number one projected defense for 2020. So in fantasy football this week, I'm going to go ahead and say start Emmanuel Sanders against Tampa Bay secondary that was very poor against wide receivers last year. And this game has all the makings of a high-scoring game, so you will not go wrong with Emmanuel Sanders. This next question is from uh, a guy I'm going to try my absolute best to respond or answer this question and pronounce his name, Von der Schluska, with an exclamation mark at the end. Can't forget that. Start Devin Singletary or Marlon Mack. Mack 100% all the way. I just raved about him when I was talking about Jonathan Taylor. He's a guy you can't sleep on, and a great matchup against the Jacksonville Jaguars, who were surprisingly not that good against uh, the run last season. So start Marlon Mack, and actually, personally, as a Devin Singletary owner myself, I am kind of concerned with Zach Moss in the mix. So I want to wait and see how Devin Singletary performs. I can tell you I'm going to start Singletary in my flex just because he's the best option that I have. So you can't really go wrong. But if I had the option between Singletary or Mac, I would 100% start Marlon Mack. All right, let's go ahead and take one last question. And that is, should I start Carson Wentz or Ben Roethlisberger. Dude, you cannot go wrong with either one. This was from Shoddy Bugatti Gaming. Wow, what a name. You guys are creative with your names. Carson Wentz or Big Ben, you cannot go wrong with either one. If I had to lean towards one over the other, I'm going to go with Big Ben. Ben Roethlisberger is uh, very underrated, and he seems like he has fully recovered from the elbow injury that he had in 2019, and he's good to go. Uh, against this Giants defense that actually just released DeAndre Baker, their secondary could be in trouble. So Big Ben, Juju Smith-Schuster, yeah, start all those guys. Start those Pittsburgh, uh, that Pittsburgh offense. Uh, As far as Carson Wentz, Washington, yeah. I mean, I predict, personally, predict Washington's defense to do better than they did in 2019 because of Chase Young being that... uh, that one cornerstone player on that defense. So uh, Carson Wentz won't do too terrible, but if I had the option between Wentz or Big Ben, I am starting Big Ben. Well, that's it for uh, this episode uh, for week one of the 2020 NFL season. We thank you guys so much for watching this on YouTube. And if you've been listening to this on iTunes, hey man, go over to YouTube. Go subscribe to us on there. We have a lot of video content for you guys throughout the week on there and vice versa if you don't like watching this show all the way through a video on youtube just head on over to itunes go uh subscribe to us on there and listen to us on the go with all that said thank you guys so much for watching or listening to this episode and i'll see you later